What you're seeing here is a simulation of a spiral galaxy. I created this for one of my music videos that I'll put a link to at the end of this video. And I thought that I would show how easy this was to do using the physics engine in Blender. If you're not familiar with Blender, it's a 3D app, which basically means that it is a representation of a three-dimensional space on your two-dimensional screen. Perhaps someday we'll have three-dimensional something or another to work on. But for now, with our two-dimensional screens, let's get going. If you're not familiar with Blender, I suggest checking out some tutorials on it or introductions to it. If you're only interested in the, let's call it the meat and potatoes, even though I'm a vegan, <laughs> of the uh, physics, well then, let's get into it. Just for some basic information, I'm using the EV render engine, and I'm only doing one sample. The reason for that is because each of these stars is actually a light emitter. So there's really no reason to do a whole bunch of samples. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. I'm using a bloom effect on it, which gives it that lovely glow that you can see on the stars. And that's about it for those settings. So now let's look at how this was done. There are only two objects in this entire scene only one of which is visible, and that's the star that's been multiplied 50,000 times. If we go back to the very first frame of this animation, because it's actually beginning from the beginning, from only one star. I'm going to zoom into it now using the decimal point key, and there it is. It looks kind of crude, doesn't it? But keep in mind that we're not seeing them up close. And when we see them in the camera distance, what, well, what we're seeing right now is also the emitter, so we don't really see what we're seeing. But once I roll it, there you go. You can see this is a huge collection of stars that's very small and growing and growing over the course of a thousand frames. And this is actually being calculated in real time as we're watching this, which is very impressive. Now, let's get back to frame one, frame zero, as it were, and zoom in again. The strange pattern that you see on this star is the texture that I used for it. The star itself consists of an icosphere, if I switch to a non-textured mode, now you can see it quite plainly. Wireframe even more plainly. What I've done also, as you can see from these little wobbly lines, is I've randomized the vertices very slightly. The reason for that is so that, especially when we have 50,000 of them, if they're all exactly identical, it actually does show. So just having that very tiny bit of distortion applied to the vertices completely eliminates that, let's just call it ugliness. So that's basically all I had to do there. Getting back to the texture, let's look at the material. Selecting the icosphere, and here's the material tab. I used an emission shader. And for the color here, if I click, you can see the various choices for starting points. And I chose the magic texture. The magic texture is basically what you see right here as it's been mapped onto this sphere. It's just really noise, but with three colors. And what I've done is I've altered the hue and the saturation, not the saturation, sorry, the value, 
the hue and the value slightly here to get these colors that I wanted so that if we now zoom back out and go to the last frame, now you can see that there are these nice little spots of color on the occasional very bright star. And that's as a result of using that magic texture. So that takes care of the basics in that regard. So if we now ignore that and go to the other object at the beginning, which is that plane, I'll zoom in again. I'll try to zoom in again. Maybe a third time. Why won't it zoom in? I don't have it selected, that's why. Sorry. There we go. This plane, if I rotate the camera, you can see that it disappears because it is a, literally a two-dimensional plane, even though we're looking at a two-dimensional screen. But as you can see, it's being represented in three dimensions on two dimensions. I'll, I'll try not to get lost in the weeds on that one. But So it is actually a plane. And the reason that I'm using a plane is when we are looking straight on, it disappears because of the edge, because it's zero pixels thick. But if we look at its face, then we see the thickness of it, if you will. And if I zoom in again, you can see, there you go. Now, the reason that we see that one star, I'll get to that very quickly now, actually. The plane, which I've now selected, if we go to the physics tab, which is this, or the particles, as it were, sorry, we've created a particle system. I'm not going to go through all of those steps. All I had to do is just create this particle system and I'm going to show you the settings that I enabled on it. It's an emitter, the plane itself that is, and under emission, I told it I want 50,000, and starting at frame zero, ending at frame 2000, even though we're only going up to roughly 1200 or so in our little animation that we're creating, but that's neither here nor there. I didn't want to get right to the end of the lifetime of this galaxy in our video. So what this means is over the course of 2000 frames, it's going to emit 50,000 particles, or let's call them stars. And they're being evenly distributed. And under lifetime, I chose 4,000 just because when I was creating this initially, I wasn't sure how many frames I was going to need and I didn't want them to suddenly wink out of existence while it was ongoing. The lifetime randomness is zero because I just want them all to last, to outlast the video as it were. Now, that's it for emission. Under source, I'm telling it to emit from the volume of a two-dimensional plane. Now you may ask yourself, what's the volume of a two-dimensional plane? And that's the trick. Because we want the galaxy, like a true galaxy in our universe, to be a plane itself. You should know that galaxies do not have a spherical shape. They are disks. And so this is a nice little workaround that I created for this one where because it's being emitted from the volume of a plane, it's only going to be emitted along one or as it were two axes, not a third one. If we look here on the left side of the screen where we see this yellowish representation of the very same um, star or sphere, as it were, and the plane. And now I will play the same animation from frame 1000 roughly again. And you can see as it's rolling that although there is some spillage, I'm going to zoom out. It's basically 
a two-dimensional point cloud with a little bit of spillage in the third dimension. If we go right back to frame zero, you will see that at the beginning, it is very much two-dimensional. But as it goes, there's a little bit. And I'll explain now, what, well, not now, but very soon, what's happening here. So, let's get back here to the right side. I've told it to emit from the volume, and as you could see there, that's giving us this two-dimensional action. Most of it. There's more to come. So I'm going to start minimizing things here because we have a lot to look at here. The next basic step here is for the cache. What I've done here is I'm doing it all in real time in the RAM of the computer. But if you don't have copious amounts of memory, especially for a very large simulation like this, then you would want to use the disk cache. But I'm doing it all in RAM, because I've got lots. So we can ignore all of this now. And now we get to the good stuff. The velocity for these particles, which we must think of now as stars, they are being given by me a starting velocity along the normal. And again, because we are emitting from this two-dimensional plane, the normal, as it were, is pointing at us through the screen right now, which is the direction that they will be coming at. And I'm giving it a very, very, very slow nudge of 0 0.01 meters per second. Basically, just so that they're not completely stationary. Everything else is at zero. So we can ignore that now. I'm not doing any rotation, which may seem strange, con consisting of, I mean, uh, considering what you just saw, but that doesn't matter because we will see why in a moment. I'm using basic Newtonian physics with the default mass of one kilo. So we can ignore that now. Oh, we can't close that yet because we need to look at the forces. This is critical for the tuning of our galaxy. And interestingly enough, all I required was to set the drag to one. The default is zero. Even though it says in the descriptor the amount of air drag, and you may say to yourself, well, there's no air in space, that is just sort of a, a catch-22 here because it's all space and it's just simulated air. And if we took out the drag, if we made it zero, then we would simulate space. So why are we using this if there's no air in space? I'll get to that in a moment. This is important. I'll show what happens without in a moment. We're not doing any deflection. The integration is set basically to default, which is indicative of the speed for the simulation how many frames per second, or in this case, how many seconds per frame. It's being tuned for 30 frames per second, even though we're doing 24. Doesn't matter. It's fiddly stuff. I don't need that kind of control over the speed. The speed is good. Next is render as object. There are other options to choose. Object is what we want because we've created this interesting little mundane boring star as our beginning. And so under the next one, which is object, this is where we actually choose it. When I created it, I called it star. The reason that it's grayed out up here is because I'm not actually showing it. That's the one that I created. I have it grayed out because we don't need to see that in the display or even in the render. That's just when I was creating it. And so I named it star by double clicking right there to give it its name. And now we can get rid of it again and go back to the plane so we can see everything again. And that's what I chose here. By clicking here, you get to choose from the various objects that exist. Obviously, we don't have a lot to choose from, including this light that doesn't even need to be there. That's just there by default, and I didn't bother to eliminate it. But I chose star, as I will do again now. And I checked for object scale. Nothing under extra. Now we can minimize this stuff. 
there are no children, and field weights is important. Everything's default except for a couple of things. I increased the vortex force from one to two. I increased the magnetic force to 10. Both of these are really critical. I'll get to why in a moment. We're almost done. I just want to explain all this stuff first. The next thing down is the force field settings. It's important to check self-effect, which means that the particles themselves, we only see one right now, but soon there will be thousands and thousands of them. We want them to affect themselves and each other. So that's critical. The amount is default, which is one, which is fine, because what I did when I was creating this is I left those kinds of things at default and then fine-tuned them as I was working with them instead of doing it globally like this. So there are two force fields that I'm using. The first one, this closes the opening that I created earlier about not using rotation, even though the objects were rotating, the stars. That's because I'm using a vortex. So I simply chose it from the pull down. There are many different options here. I chose vortex. And here's where I changed some settings. And it's interesting because these quite large round numbers worked perfectly. 10 for the strength, 10 for the flow. I want it to affect the location of the stars, but not the rotation. It doesn't matter because they're not, they're spheres. So you're not going to see whether or not they're rotating. And this is important, the noise amount, also 10. And that's it for the vortex, except for now down here, we have again, a very critical setting, the fall off for the vortex. I've told it to use the Z direction for both. And I gave it a fall off power of three, which means how quickly, as you can see by the little descrip description here, this is the strength of the fall off of the strength. <laughs> yes, the speed, I guess, of the fall off of the strength of this force field. So we want the vortex to drop off as the stars are moving further and further from the center of the galaxy. And so this is the amount that I arrived at from my experiments that gave us the right amount of fall off of the vortex to give us that beautiful pinwheel shape. So that's everything for the first force field. The second one is equally important, and that is turbulence. Now this one, I really didn't change anything except for the strength. I just gave it a strength of one and that's it. Nothing else to do here. So it's very simple. And that gives us that little bit of natural beauty. If I skip ahead to frame 1000 again and zoom out to our camera view, which we've now, I guess, oh, I've made some changes. And so we've lost our animation, our physics. So I'm going to go back to frame zero and now we're going to get to watch it, calculate everything all over again as it plays. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see how it starts off. And so that little, let me start it again. So we begin with this single star. This bar that we're seeing now is not visible in the final rendering. It's just here now for our reference. So as I roll it, watch what happens. All of the stars are going to be emitted from random spots on this plane. And then the vortex is going to act on them immediately. And so watch, it's, either, it's, it's kind of interesting actually to watch how it happens and it will grow and grow. Here we go. 
And you see how at the leading edge of it, they're moving further and further apart in random ways. See how I follow it with my mouse. That's the noise and the turbulence. Let me zoom out a bit so we can see it acting more and more. And see how that, there's a few that are moving out further and further. And if we look here at the left side of the screen now, that noise and turbulence is the reason why there's a bit of divergence away from being a completely two-dimensional plane. But we don't mind that little bit. That's actually quite natural because that's the way that it is with real galaxies as well. They aren't completely two-dimensional, just generally. The vast majority is on a two-dimensional plane. So let me get back out to the camera view now. Oh, that's the wrong one. There we go. Let me get that. There we go. And so you see how these arms are now beginning to form? We're not quite there yet. We're at frame 850 and counting here. And so as it ages, as this simulation goes on further and further, it becomes more and more of that pinwheel galaxy that we want to see. And as we approach frame 1000, which is where I began the video clip, it starts to really look like it. And there we have it. So this is where it began. And as it goes, it just gets more and more pronounced and more elegant and more beautiful. So I'm going to stop that now and explain some more of these settings above that I very quickly skipped over earlier as I was getting down to these force fields, which are responsible for this beautiful pinwheel galaxy that we just saw. So right now, as I said earlier, I had the emitter showing, but that's only for the viewport. It does not matter. I'll just leave that for now. The other thing that I didn't explain in enough detail was the, the field weights. These values, again, which are very round numbers, they were arrived at along with these force field settings specifically so that I could get to this pinwheel type look at a certain stage in the simulation. If I were to change these, for example, let's change the vortex from two to one and then start the simulation again. As you can see, things are flying out of control a lot more than they were before. Now, if we go back and we change our magnetic to the default of one and roll it again, So now the stars are no longer attracting each other. They are, but not to the same extent as they were before. And so as you can see, the galaxy is going to fly apart. And it won't give us that beautiful look. It's still beautiful, but it's not the one that I want. <laughs> And so you can see that these things are easily adjusted to your taste for whatever it is that you wish to do. If I was to change the vortex strength to, say, 1 on the actual vortex modifier field effect, look at what happens now. 
I don't think it's even going to make it through a single rotation. So this is how things begin by default. I believe the flow starts at one also, and the noise is going to be zero by default. Look at what happens now. It's interesting, but it's certainly not a spiral galaxy. Almost looks like a bird. This would be a good Rorschach blot generator. So as you can see, you can have a lot of fun with these particle systems. I kind of like that, actually. Well, on that rather dramatic note, I think we're done. Here's your chance to check out the video. And also, let me know in the comments if you want to see more of these Blender videos. Until later, have fun.